All right, so it is Tuesday, the 12th of January, 2020. This is European history, and we're going to start out with the way finals are going to work. All of you who are here are expected to be here, unless you have a doctor's note that is specific to the date of your final. The alternative to being here and taking the test in person is a zero. So be here and take the test or make sure if there's some kind of God forbid crisis that pulls you away from here that you have it documented and that that documentation references the specific date uh, of the uh, of the final, which is next Tuesday. Um, obviously, during the final, you have access to your memory and your judgment. And that's about it. Uh, let's see. Your exam is 8 o'clock this coming Tuesday, January the 19th, and it runs until 9.55, so you have just shy of two hours. And usually what we're able to do is have everyone take the exam, complete it, and correct it so that you know before you leave what you earned for the first semester. Once I enter your semester grade, or your final exam grade for the first semester, that combined with your first and second quarter averages will tell you what you earned. So uh, I like to give that as a, uh, as a present so that when you leave here, you know exactly how you've done. Uh, those of you who are online, I have posted instructions, but you will take the exam at the same time as everyone else. I will provide the exam to you by email at the beginning of the exam period. You will complete it and turn it in before the end of the exam period. Um, if you, for whatever reason, can't do that, you also will need the documentation saying why you couldn't possibly take the exam along with everyone else at the same time. So the exam is just under two hours. You will have just under two hours. So you need to free up this coming t uh, Tuesday, the 19th, from 8 o'clock to 9.55 to take my unit or my semester exam. Anyone here have any questions about that? Okay. Oh, just drop it on the shelf when you're done. Head back to your seat. Thank you. Next, uh, just in case I hadn't mentioned it, and because I want to mention it to those of you who are online for some reason, for the sake of completeness, the advanced placement students will meet me for lunch today so that we can go over your work requirements for the coming quarter and more. Um... I think that's it for housekeeping. So, where we've been is we have begun to talk about the nature of industry itself. And we were talking about how things are made. We are so disconnected from the production of those necessities that we depend on that there are actually people who think that Meat comes from the supermarket in nicely cellophane wrappers. Now, I don't think many people believe that, but I think there are some people who just don't understand that for every tasty, scrumptious piece of meat that you eat, uh, some little piggy or chicken or cow needs to die. And it's a wonderful purpose for which they die, because I love eating them. Um, if you are a person who's a vegetarian... Uh, understand that the work that went into growing those plants, and everyone should eat their vegetables, uh, is amazingly, amazingly difficult. The food that we eat, the drinks that we have, the relatively clean air and water that we benefit from, the plenty that is our, so far, norm, is not accidental. It is a result of thousands of years of slow progress. It's a result of 230 odd years of ongoing freedom in our republic. It's a result of the rule of law. It's a result of manners between citizens because we control ourselves. We don't need others to control us. Therefore, we are free. And it's a result of industry, of the industrial revolution. Those people who think that we can go back to some form of organic pre-industrial system 
uh, that is not at all industrial. <laughs> or worse, those people who think that we can have some kind of anarchy and everything will just be fine are dreaming. The system of prices that allow people to work productively without worrying constantly about bandits and thieves to produce their lot, which is part of a grand production that gives us our modern lifestyle. This all is very, very, very hard to do. And if you reduce things to some simple ideology, whether that ideology is anarchy, anarcho-syndicalism, socialism, communitarianism, or any other kind of ism that has some theorist, theorist I don't know whose paper that is, but they should get it, um, that has some theorist deciding what is and is not. No. What we have is a result of hundreds of years of freedom and thousands of years of progress and hundreds of years of industry. Appreciating where our food comes from, where our clothing comes from, how it's made, how electrical power is generated, how things are brought all the way here from all of the various places around the world that they are produced. Think of the well, China now, but when I was your age, a lot of it was still produced here in the United States. We hadn't gone so far down the road of deindustrialization and globalization. Um, think about the pencil that Milton Friedman talked about. All of the people that need to come together to make that pencil. All of the resources from the wood, the graphite, the rubber, the, the copper ferrule, the paint, everything, the glue and the production facility that brought it all together, and the distribution network that brought it to you to buy at the grocery store or wherever it is you buy your pencils. All of this is complicated. And all of this is so very different from the medieval way of life, where a person knows everyone in their production line, where pretty much everything a person uses is grown locally. Now, there are people who think, oh, that's wonderful. We're eating locally sourced foods. Mm -hmm. Which is why famine was normal twice a year, every year for everyone. Because locally sourced foods grown in a subsistence agriculture system does not produce a reliable food surplus every year. In fact, it doesn't re produce reliably enough food every year just to maintain the basic population of the region. Our global population now is so great that if we got rid of our industrial systems, networks, processes, chemicals, all the rest, most of the world's people would starve. But before people starve to death, trust me, we would go to war and we discharge all sorts of weapons because people do not go quietly into that cold, dark night. Most human beings tend to panic. Just look at the way people are looking at this virus. It's not rational, it's not calm, it's not measured, and it's not in proportion. People are acting like this is the worst thing ever, and compared to any other pandemic we've ever had, this is chump change minor stuff. <gasps> yes, it's true. For people who get it and die, it's real. For family members who get it and die, it's real. But the likelihood of you dying from this disease, unless you are very old or very ill with pre-existing conditions, is very low, at least as we've seen in the United States thus far. And yet we're acting like it's the black leaping death. And if you try talking to people about different ideas, you see the frenzy in their eye. Wear your mask! as if somehow that's going to actually help. <sighs> In any event, got that off my chest for the moment. Um, we went over how a factory drivetrain works. You'll need to know that. Uh, we went over how water power powers everything in a mill without a, 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 a jolt of electricity. We talked about how cottage industry becomes mills and factories. We talked about the flying shuttlecock. Now, as we shift from water power to steam power, one must wonder what fire 
we burn? Well, in our part of the world, wood is fairly common. And the trees are a crop. So you grow wood, you cut it down, you burn it, you plant new wood, and if you're smart about it, you won't have any problems finding wood. The problem is, though different woods burn differently, and if you've never burned fragrant, fragrant wood in a wood stove or a fireplace on a cold, rainy night, you should. It's cozy as heck. It's wonderful. Uh, birch is a wonderful wood for that. We used to do that in college. Um, but wood doesn't burn particularly hot. So what about converting wood into charcoal? Well, charcoal burns hotter than wood. But it still doesn't burn that hot. What you really want is coal. Now, I will tell you, the best pizzas in the world are produced in New Haven, Connecticut, and New York City. And the reason for that is the, the way the water is, the fact that you have genuine Italians making it, and also that in those places there are a series of brick oven coal-fired pizza joints. And the way that the crust cooks in a coal-fired brick oven is like no other pizza anywhere. Some of the people around here have wood-fired, uh, and that's good. There's no question. It's really good. But it's not compare, comparable to coal-fired stuff. Uh, in New Haven, there are two uh, uh, pizza joints, uh, Pepe's Pizza and Sally's Pizza, and they compete with one another. And New Haven-style pizza is super, 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 super thin crust, thinner than New York crust. But it takes days to heat up their ovens and days to cool down their ovens. Because if they don't do it slow enough, the bricks will actually crack and shatter because of the differences in temperature. They've got to be very careful about keeping that coal uh, smoldering, burning. Coal burns much hotter and much more regularly than does wood. And there are two types of coal, anth anthracite coal and bituminous coal. I'm not going to get into the details. One of them is significantly better than the other. But coal actually does grow, if you will, in our part of the world, in the parts of the world where industry begins. In England, plenty of coal. The United States of America is the Saudi Arabia of coal. We've got massive coal reserves. And uh, so Germany has coal in the Ruhr Valley. So anyone in the early industrial period who's converting to steam engines, who has a ready supply of locally sourced coal, is going to be in an advantageous position. And all it just so happens, whether it's an accident or not, that all of the uh, areas that industrialized early not only had plentiful water power, but they also had plentiful coal reserves. Now, you also probably know how coal can affect things if you burn a lot of it without refining the smoke. Do any of you know any of the effects, and any of you cite, should I say, any of the effects of massive coal burning? Build up of greenhouse gases in the end. Yes, that's one of them. Um, but there are other much more dramatic effects, much more observable effects than a long-term increase in carbon. Yeah. Especially in large cities, if you burn it, um, create like a smog over the entire city. Yeah. And I'm old enough to remember when we still burned a lot of coal. Uh, that stopped very soon in my youth, but, uh, there are areas of the country that for over a hundred years had this sort of brownish yellow smoke uh, covering their cities. It was a rare day when the wind was strong enough to clear it away. This smog, this smoke and fog produced by coal is still typical in China and in India, those two massively new industrial powers that are still using cheap and easy to use coal. If the United States, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of the developed world 
didn't burn another bit of oil or coal. Uh, the fact that China and India are still building coal plants and using coal plants would um, still, if you believe in that sort of thing, uh, trend the environment towards the kind of gloom and doom that man-made environmental climate believers say is going to happen. In other words, nothing that we do without India or China will matter beyond a certain point if you believe in the global models. Massive coal burning. Now, in addition to the brown and uh, uh, yellow skies, you have what's called acid rain. Do any of you know what acid rain is? Oh, you're just so good at this. Yes. Yeah. So it's basically. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Okay. So basically, it's when the, it rains and then the rain, the smog gets caught in the rain mm -hmm. and then it brings all the chemicals into the city and the ground. Yeah. So you end up with. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? No. Okay. Uh, it basically is a slow poison to the groundwater and it can blight vegetable growth and uh, it, is, it isn't very pleasant. It's not like alien blood, you know, acid rain, where if you get a drop on it, it'll, it'll eat through your skin, but it's uh, acidic and it is not particularly healthy. Um, these things all happen in the industrial world as a result of in, beginning to use coal. But as shattering as massive burning of coal can be to the climate, the acquisition of coal, especially early on before we mechanize it, is a, an amazing process. So please turn in your notes to George Orwell's excerpts from the road to Wigan Pier. Now, along with Doris Lessing, George Orwell is truly my favorite communist or former communist. And here's why. Orwell is intellectually honest. Orwell is a true believer. He starts out as a, a British policeman in India, and he ends up becoming a writer, a journalist. He ends up volunteering to fight on the socialist side in the Spanish Civil War. And um, he isn't used very much during World War II because of his health and also because he was deemed to be politically unreliable. In the Spanish Civil War, he was fighting for communism because he believed in communism. But his form of communism had intellectual freedom. We share the means of production and the fruits of that production equitably. But we're allowed to think our own thoughts and speak our own words without restraint. That was Orwell's personal vision of the communist utopia, which marked him for death when Stalin's people, who were also in Spain fighting uh, for communism, uh, found out that Orwell wouldn't shut up and do what he was told. So he fled the communist side in the Spanish Civil War back to England to avoid getting assassinated by the Soviet secret police. After that, he was a former communist who still believed in the ideal that I just described, communitarian physical property, but a free intellectual uh, life, to the rest, to the end of his days. And uh, he wrote books like Animal Farm, which if you had my uh, civics class, uh, what, uh, I don't think any of you did, uh, I, I played a movie and we talked of, uh, some of you have read, and he, he wrote what I think is his greatest work, 1984. Written in 1948, he was just writing about some indeterminate point in the near future where communism took over. And it is not a pretty picture. It's basically the classical archetype of a totalitarian police state where everyone is surveilled. The scary thing is that what's been built in China over the last few years with their social credit system is actually much worse because Orwell could not predict the sophistication of modern computer technology. But thanks to Silicon Valley and the American tech industry, the Chinese have a, a Communist Party has a capacity to spy on and mess with individual people in China that no previous tyranny has ever had. So I'm saying all of this to illustrate to you how George Orwell is a serious person when it comes to wanting the lives of working people to get better. 
He was inspired to become a communist because he didn't like the inequality that existed in society. And as a journalist, even as his eyes were opening to the downsides of state communism, at least, he, he never gave up his commitment to point out the horrible lives that working people had to endure in those days. So the road to Wigan Pier is a collection of his observations going to the industrial north of England, to Lancashire and so forth, and Yorkshire, to the coal mining country, to into coal mines. And this is a guy who's, you know, educated, college educated, doesn't have personal experience with this stuff, but he wants to understand and he wants to bring this to the wider world. So please read along with me as I go through some of his observations. On going down into a coal mine, the time to go there is when the machines are roaring and the air is black with coal dust, and when you can actually see what the miners have to do. At those times, the places like hell are at any rate my own mental picture of hell. Most of the things one imagines in hell are there, heat, noise, confusion, darkness, foul air, and above all, unbearably cramped space. Everything in hell except the fire. At the coal face. When you have finally got there, and getting there is a job in itself, I'll explain that in a moment, you crawl through the last line of pit props and see opposite you a shiny black wall three or four feet high. This is the coal face. Overhead is the smooth ceiling made by the rock from which the coal has already been cut. Underneath is the rock again, so that the gallery you are in is only as high as the ledge of coal itself, probably not more than a yard. Imagine this. You're significantly underground, maybe an eighth of a mile underground, maybe a quarter of a mile underground, maybe a half a mile underground. You go down the main roads, and then you go out into the warrens of tunnels until you get to the particular coal face you're working on. There are little carts with temporary small gauge railroads that bring the coal out away from the coal face. But as you get closer and closer to the coal, you have to bend lower and lower until finally you're in a gallery farther than you can see to your left or to your right, just open space. And above you, ready to pancake everything, is this inexorable rock and below you is the same rock, because what you're in is where the coal used to be. So you clamber and climb through this narrow space. Held, The ceiling is held together away from the floor by these wooden struts. That, those are the pit props he's talking about. Just imagine the claustrophobia of it. You're in this wide space, and you know how much is above you, because you went down through it to get here. What little accident it would take to just bring that rock above you to pancake below and there's no one that's going to even find your remains so that's the gallery he's talking about this is the coal face the, art. the first impression of all overwhelming everything else for a while is the frightful deafening din from the conveyor belt, which carries the coal away. You cannot see very far because the fog of coal dust throws back at the beam of your lamp, the lamp on your helmet. But you can see on either side of you the line of half-naked kneeling men, one to every four or five yards, driving their shovels under the fallen coal and flinging it swiftly over their left shoulders. They are feeding it onto the conveyor belt that's behind them, a moving rubber belt a couple of feet wide, which runs a yard or two behind them. Down this belt, a glistening river of coal races constantly. In a big mine, it's carried away several tons every minute. It bears it off to some place in the main roads, 
where it is shot into tubs, holding half a ton each, and thence dragged to the cages and hoisted to the outer air. Now that's in a mechanized coal mine. In the 19th century, Orwell was writing in the 1930s. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, everything was manual. You know what you use to get into the small spaces? Children. Because, again, like in the fields, coal miners bring their children to work. Every day is bring your son to work day. And uh, you bring your son to work when he's capable of struggling into the areas that no adult can fit in to do real work, to cut coal away, to bring it down, and so forth. So this is a family affair. And everything in the 19th century is done again by, by muscle power. It's impossible to watch these fillers at work without feeling a pang of envy for their toughness. It's a dreadful job that they do, an almost superhuman job by the standards of an ordinary person, for they are not only shifting monstrous quantities of coal, they are also doing it in a position that doubles or trebles the work. They're bent over squat and they've got to toss it back accurately. They've got to remain kneeling all the while. Imagine kneeling on rock all day, shoveling body weights behind you. And the other uh, conditions don't exactly make things easier. There is the heat. It varies, but in some minds, it's suffocating. And the coal dust that stuffs up your throat and nostrils and collects along your eyelids. And the unending, unending rattle of the conveyor belt, which in that confined space is rather like the rattle of a machine gun. Now, I'm not a manual labor or well, laborer, Orwell writes, and please God, I never shall be one. But there are some kinds of manual work that I could do if I had to. In a pinch, I could be a tolerable road sweeper or a, an inefficient gardener or even a tenth-rate farmhand. But by no conceivable amount of effort or training could I become a coal miner. The work would kill me in a few weeks. Watching coal miners at work, you realize momentarily what different universes people inhabit. Down there, where coal is dug, is a sort of world apart, which one can quite easily go through life without ever hearing about. Yet, it is the absolutely necessary counterpart to our world above, in order that Hitler may march the goose step, that the Pope may denounce Bolshevism, that the cricket crowds may assemble at Lords, that the Nancy poets may scratch one another's backs. Coal has got to be forthcoming. Their lamplit world down there is as necessary to the daylight world above as the root is to the flower. It is so with all types of manual work. It keeps us alive, and we are oblivious of its existence. In a way, it's even humiliating to watch coal miners working. It raises in you a momentary doubt about your own status as an intellectual and a superior person generally. For it is brought home to you at least while you are watching, that it's only because miners sweat their guts out that superior persons can remain superior. All of us really owe the comparative decency to our of our lives to poor drudges underground, black into the eyes with their throats full of coal dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and belly muscles of steel. This was true then. Even in our mechanized age, it is true now. All of this comfort, cleanliness, all of this sense of well-being that we have comes from the effort of others. And when you are a productive member of society yourself, you will be participating in that. And there's pride there. Pride in being a part of something necessary and useful. Whatever you consider for your future, and I have no idea what you want to do, or the truth is you yourself are going to change your mind probably several times before you end up doing what you end up doing. Make sure it's something that, that you find satisfying 
and that you can be proud of doing. Because there's going to come a point, as silly as it may sound, where your job is important to your identity. If you're raising children and are a housewife at home, that's a really important job. And lots of people find satisfaction in that, even some men. If you're digging coal, well, we still have coal. We still have coal mines. We have entire regions of this country that depend on coal. Uh, we also have the oil industry. We also have being a truck driver. You wouldn't think being a truck driver is very much. But without truck drivers, supplies don't get what they need. Find the nobility in your job. Find the utility in it. Find the thing that you're doing that is just by going to work, making the world a better place. But also appreciate with some humility the work of others. Don't get too into the habit of scoffing, of sneering, of acting like you're above. That's a bad habit to be in. And intellectuals are very prone to it. They're very prone to being that way and to passing that those qualities on to others. Try to be humble about what you do and try to be proud of what you do. And you'll be happier for it. I think. Okay, then he goes on talking about the lives that they lead. On page 37, he talks about, Orwell talks about, the iniquitous swindle of making the miner pay for the hire of his lamp. At sixpence a week, he buys the lamp several times over in a single year. So in some company towns, a company town is a community built around a production facility where everyone depends upon the company. Uh, where the company runs the store, the company rents the houses. The company rents the tools that coal miner, miners use. The coal miners don't have to buy their tools. They can't. They've got to rent the tools provided by the company. And so instead of the coal miner finally paying for his helmet and his, uh, his uh, what do you pick, um, the coal miner is constantly and constantly and constantly renting, and there's no payoff. It's like renting a house. You rent and rent and rent, and you get to stay there, but you never get to get the title of the home. If you buy the house, you pay your mortgage, but eventually you own the house. Well, coal miners, among others, are rented their gear, and therefore they never own it, and they've got to pay back. In other words, they've got to pay to go to work, because you can't work without gear. As you walk through the industrial towns, and he's talking here again about Yorkshire, and Lancashire, the north of England, you lose all, you lose yourself in labyrinths of little brick houses, blackened by smoke, festering in planless chaos, round miry alleys and little cindered yards, where there are stinking dustbins and lines of gray, grimy washing and half ruinous water closets. A water clo closet is an outdoor latrine. Page 52. In such places as these, a woman is only a poor drudge muddling among an infinity of jobs. She may keep up her spirits, but she cannot keep up the standards of cleanliness and tidiness in her home. There is always something to be done, and no conveniences, and almost literally no room to turn around. No sooner have you washed one child's face than another's is dirty. Before you've washed the crocks from one meal, the next one is due to be cooked. Next page. I found great variation in the houses I visited. Some were as decent as one could possibly expect in the circumstances. Some were so appalling that I have no hope of describing them adequately. Give people a decent house, and they will soon learn to keep it decently. Moreover, with a smart-looking house to live up to, they improve in self-respect and cleanliness, and their children start life with better chances. Nevertheless, in a corporation of state, that's a company town, uh, there is an uncomfortable, almost prison-like atmosphere, and the people who live there are perfectly well aware of it. When my grandmother was a little girl, her family, she was born in Harlem. Her family lived in Harlem in the Bronx, New York. But uh, to get out of the city in the summertime and to give their kids a, a taste of the countryside and of America, my immigrant great-grandparents 
uh, found a, a set of cabins up in the Connecticut River Valley of central Vermont, uh, central eastern Vermont, called Shanty Shane. So every summer after school got out, uh, my grandmother and her brother and sister would um, get on a train with their mom and go up from New York City to Vermont to White River Junction. They'd get off and then they'd get transported up to Shanty Shane. And there they would work as cleaning staff. My grandmother would do some jobs. Her mom would work very, very hard. But they're in the Connecticut River Valley in the sweltering months of July and August. They're not in stinking Bronx, which is hell in July and August, I can tell you. So traveling in those days was a, an event. And like people used to dress up when they went on a plane, you, know, you wouldn't think of going on a plane without wearing your jacket and tie if you were a gentleman, or a nice dress if you were a lady. Back in the 1920s, my grandmother and her family would dress up to go north on the train. And she remembered one year, just for this journey at the end of school, her parents got her this beautiful white lace linen dress. And so she was all dressed up to the nines and she was very proud. She and the family went and my great grandfather who worked all summer in New York, except for a week or two, uh, joined them and, and wished them farewell. And they got on the train and they went north. By the time that they reached White River Junction, Vermont, that beautiful white dress was a dark gray. The coal dust from the engine that pulled the train came into the windows. There's no air conditioning. You open the windows. So the coal dust came in and it covered everything. One of the things about coal dust is it's fine. Coal dust particles are smaller than the pores of your skin. So anyone who's around coal a lot develops a sallow complexion. Coal miners are famous for not being able to wash off <clears throat> the black on their hands. And it takes years of being out of the mines for a coal miner's skin to just push out the, the final bits of dust. Coal dust gets everywhere. Into your skin, into your clothes, not onto, into the weave of your clothes. Coal dust gets into your hair, your eyes, your food, your water everything. We're not talking here about the haze of brown and yellow. We're not talking here about acid rain. We're talking about the immediate effects of being somewhere near where coal is burning. You get the dust. And if you're a coal miner, the dust is everywhere. And if you live in a coal mining town, the dust is everywhere. And if you live anywhere near a smokestack, ditto. And again, without air conditioning, people open their windows. And there's no, you know, so, so the coal dust gets everywhere in the house. It's ubiquitous. You can't get away from it. Now, as to how difficult it was for the women who tried to, to keep a decent house, I can only explain this by analogy. My friend and his wife, who came over just before Tiananmen Square from China, when they were young married, they got a, a long-haired white cat they called Qianxi after their favorite emperor of the Manchu dynasty, the Qianxi Emperor. Qianxi was pale albino, actually, had some albino eyes, and was deaf. They didn't realize Qianxi was deaf when they got him, but he was. Uh, he and the orange cat they had, Strider, got along, but it's just Qianxi couldn't hear but that wasn't the biggest problem Qiangxi had. Qiangxi had this beautiful long hair. And as time went on, they had, you know, he was in graduate school to become a minister. Uh, she, she was working hard. Then they had their first child. Then they had their second child. And they didn't have time to keep up with the cat. A short-haired cat will maintain itself, but a long-haired cat usually needs help. They usually need trimming around the back region. Well, at first, and right after being trimmed, Qiangxi would 
work really hard at trying to stay clean, but after a while he'd just give up. It was impossible. So every year when we visited, um, we would take the cat to the vet and have it trimmed because we tried trimming it ourselves and it was just too much. The hair was just this mass of sticky, disgusting yuck. They weren't cruel. They weren't negligent. Exactly. They were just working very hard for their children and for people. And they just didn't make the time that they needed to make for this long haired cat. The kind of despair that Kiang Shi felt. Cats don't normally give up on being clean. They're instinctively programmed to keep clean. A clean predator successfully hunts. A dirty predator tips off the prey long before they get anywhere nearby. But there was nothing Kiang Shi could do beyond a certain point. That just that the ability to keep that hair clean compared to the ability of the, the, the cat's body to dirty it. No, there was no comparison. So a lot of the women who kept house in those towns were in the same position as Kiangshi. And sometimes, sometimes they just gave up. Yeah? Uh, Play-Doh actually was originally invented to take coal dust and soot off of wallpaper. That's that cool. Place. I didn't know that. Uh, okay, I'll give you one in return. Uh, do you know how uh, various people used to take rust off of warships? No. Coca-Cola. They would actually use, in some places, Coca-Cola on a rusty ship hull uh, to, to, to help loosen up the dust and make it easier to scrub off. That's cool. I never knew about the Play-Doh thing. Oh, that's great. Oh, and here's another one. Why do you think crazy glue is so sticky? Crazy glue, super glue, any of those glues. Do you know why? Do you? Okay. It was originally invented as a battlefield medic, uh, medic uh, tool for Vietnam. Instead of having to, you know, you've got somebody who's got a wound and it's really wide open. Instead of having to knit it closed with sutures, uh, what they thought, and, and rightly, was you, you, hold it, you have somebody hold it together and you put some, some super glue or some crazy <laughs> glue on it, and it'll work as a temporary seal to keep the person from bleeding to death or dying of trauma. And uh, it's a great idea, but then they market it to civilians. And civilians are like, yeah, I can do all sorts of things with this. Ah! And you end up needing to go to the hospital to get it cut off of you. It's horrible. So I never use super. Appreciate it. Anyway, thank you. That's, that's cool. I never knew that. Uh, okay. So, on keeping warm. Keeping warm is almost the sole preoccupation of a single un unemployed man in winter. Regarding unemployment in the 1930s, remember, this is during the time of the Great Depression, where in the United States, one working man in four was out of work. That means 25 plus percent of the population was in severe trouble, uh, wondering where their next meal was coming from or where the next roof would be over their heads. It is a deadly thing to see a skilled man running to seed year after year in utter hopeless idleness. Unemployment is demoralizing and depress depressing. It's not just that you don't have money coming in. That's bad, especially if you have a family. That's really bad. This is sort of old fashioned, take it for what it's worth, but I think it's still basically true. Women are pretty, charming, lovely, wonderful, yada, yada, yada. And a woman tends to live through her relationships. This goes back to hunter-gatherer times. If a woman is happy in her relationships, whether they're within the family or within her group, she's usually okay. She can usually handle life. A man is not built to be beautiful. A man is built to be functional. And as time goes on, most men live through their work, not their relationships. Relationships matter to men, but we tend to take pride in what we do, in doing difficult work that is uh, that, re that requires sacrifice. If you're unemployed, not only don't you bring in money, you don't do that job. You don't earn the self-respect that every person needs. For a human being to have dignity, a human being has to have some self-respect. And I can't give you self-respect. You've got to earn that yourself. 
So for a man to be unemployed, certainly at a time when a man's identity was his work, that's bad. That is bad beyond the obvious difficulty paying the bills bad because it eats at your soul. It eats at your soul. Page 80. Of course, the post-World War I development of cheap luxuries has been a very fortunate thing for our rulers. It's quite likely that fish and chips, art silk stockings, tinned salmon, cut price chocolate, five ounce, five two ounce bars for sixpence, the movies, the radio, strong tea, and the football pools have between them averted revolution. There you get a chance to see popular culture in the 1930s. A human, oh God, Orwell does have a dark side though, and it comes out sometimes. A human being is primarily a bag for putting food into. Uh, it's more than that, George. Uh, page 82. The Great War could never have happened if tinned food had not been invented. That's true. Uh, those vast armies wrestling with each other on the Western Front needed lots of food shipped in and couldn't be shipped fresh. Page 88. This thing that Orwell's about to say is something I've heard written by everyone. Everyone who I have read who experienced life before World War I and after World War I. There's a sense that the best men are just gone. That there's a whole type of man that's just gone. Where are the monstrous men with chests like barrels and mustaches like the wings of eagles who strode across my childhood's gaze 20 or 30 years ago, buried, I suppose, in the Flanders mud, if the English physique has declined, it is no doubt partly due to the fact that the Great War carefully selected the million best men in England and slaughtered them largely before they had a chance to breed. But the process must have begun earlier than that, and it must be due ultimately to the unhealthy way of living, to industrialism. I don't mean the habit of living in towns. Probably the town is healthier than the countryside in many ways, but... The modern industrial techniques which provide you with cheap substitutes for everything. We may find in the long run that tinned food is a deadlier weapon than the machine gun. And here he's talking about the kind of lousy substitutes that we are pretty aware of. When I say we can't go back to organic, I don't mean that we should like eating bread that has a lot of sawdust in it as filler. We shouldn't. We should be careful about what goes into our food. And here he's talking about cheap substitutes that end up poisoning people over time. Uh, on the unemployed salvaging bits of useful coal from spoil heaps. All day long over the strange gray mountains you see people wandering to and fro with sacks and baskets across the sulfurous smoke. Many slag heaps are on fire under the surface, prizing out the tiny nuggets of coal which are buried here and there. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go straight to 94. Uh, it is only when you get a little further north to the pottery towns and beyond that you begin to encounter the real ugliness of industrialism, an ugliness so frightful and so arresting that you are obliged, as it were, to come to terms with it. A slag heap is at best a hideous thing. Okay, you burn coal. Not all the coal is consumed. The waste coal that won't be burned is called slag. Every so often, you've got to squeak, scrape out the coal fire area, the furnace, and get rid of the slag or you'll ruin your furnace. That slag is solid waste and it's got to go somewhere. So you end up putting it in a, in a bin and in industrial towns in the old, uh, in the old uh, industrial regions, they'd have cable cars of dustbins going out from the factories and just dumping them randomly in the countryside. And where you dump slag becomes a slag heap. These slag heaps are as high as low hills. And some of them smoke, like the tire fire in The Simpsons that burns year after year. These slag heaps are on fire year after year. So you're, you've got an environment that's just covered over with heaps of coal like a moonscape. And the coal dust blows whenever the wind blows and it leaches into the water. And sometimes, even in the heaviest range, it's still smoldering and sending out dust because the stuff you took out of the oven is still sort of smoldering. It's still sort of on fire. A slag heap is at best a hideous thing because it is so planless and functionless. It's sometimes just dumped on the earth like emptying a giant dustbin. 
On the other outskirts of the mining towns, there's a frightful landscape. There are frightful landscapes where your horizon is ringed completely round by jagged gray mountains, and underfoot is mud and ashes, and overhead the steel cables where tubs of dirt travel slowly across miles of country. Often the slag heaps are on fire, the lunar landscape of slag heaps. It seems a world from which vegetation has been banished. Nothing existed except smoke, shale, ice, mud, ashes, and foul water. When you contemplate such ugliness as this, there are two questions that strike you. First, is it inevitable? Secondly, does it matter? When I was younger, we had Doctor Who, like still exists. I liked our Doctor Who better than the Doctor Who that's out there today. Good stuff. Yeah, so it's great stuff. No, can't I'm about the newer one. They have dinosaurs oh. on a spaceship like the last episode. Of yeah, no, I, I can't. I, it's also Social Justice Warrior Central, and Doctor Who is supposed to be entertaining. I don't mind occasionally dealing with good themes, uh, deep themes, uh, but I don't want to be propagandized when I'm watching Star Trek, Doctor Who, Star Wars, or anything else. It just irritates me. Because uh, the whole point of science fiction is to get away from our current world. Anyway, they filmed several hundred alien worlds over the decades in the slag heaps of England around uh, their studios because um, they looked like an alien world. So anyway, this is the world of the coal mine and the mining towns, and it is a world whose details I hope you'll remember. Um, tomorrow, I think we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to finish up talking about industry, and then Thursday you will have a quiz on all of this, and next week you will have the uh, exam. So, thank you. You may talk quietly among yourselves until dismissal.